Good afternoon. I would like to uh, welcome you all and thank you for attending the keynote address of the fourth annual Southeast Philosophy Congress. We are very fortunate today to have as our speaker Professor James C. Doig, Professor Emeritus of Clayton State University. Uh, Professor Doig is a friend of mine. I'm pleased to count him amongst my friends. And he is also a prolific scholar of Thomas Aquinas. He's written numerous books on Aquinas and Descartes and other figures such as the Arabic commentators who were contemporary with or preceded Aquinas by a little bit. Uh, some of Professor Doig's publications include Cutting the Cartesian Knot, A Defense of Cognitive Realism, Aquinas' Commentary on the Ethics, A Philosophical Perspective, Aquinas on Metaphysics, as well as the recent publication of his translation with commentary of Averroes' Commentary on the De Anima. Professor Doig has been reading Thomas Aquinas his entire life and is here today to share with us the fruits of that reading. So please join me in giving a hearty welcome to Professor Doig. Now I did as a kid do all sorts of things other than read Thomas Aquinas. I guarantee you when I was 12 on Halloween I was hauled down to the Little Rock, Arkansas police station and it wasn't about reading Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> um, you might wonder why I chose a topic like reading Thomas Aquinas. Um, and I think I chose it because I'm a little bit tired of seeing him misread. Um, it's very hard to read him. I know I've misread him lots of times. And I'd like to begin by, by just very briefly indicating some, some things on the handout. Uh, Aquinas, Aquinas's works, published works, can be divided into four major categories. The first one is, I would include his lectures on scripture. And in regard to that, Aquinas' title as a professor at, in the Faculty of Theology at the University of Paris was Master in the Sacred Page, which means Master in Scripture. Um, he never taught anything but theology. Everything he wrote, he wrote for the sake of theology. That doesn't mean that, that many passages in his theological works uh, should not be regarded as philosophy. It doesn't mean that some of his complete works are not philosophical works. But everything he wrote was for the sake of interpreting scripture. That was his interest. That was his profession. Uh, if you look at the first page of the handout, what I've given you on the left-hand left column is uh, a, a bit from the beginning of his lecture on the Gospel of John. In the right-hand column, I've given you a, se a selection from the Summa of Theology, uh, which deals more or less with the same subject. And the point is that the one from the Summa was written for, as he says, beginners in theology. The one on the left from the, the lecture on John was written, uh, was uh, the result of his lectures to students of a much higher of intellectual ability than those for whom the Summa was written, these were students who were preparing themselves to be what he was, a master in scripture. And when you read the Summa, which we'll talk about later, read this article from the Summa and you say to yourself, okay, I understand that. You read the lecture of John and I wonder if many times people, would, people don't say, hey, I didn't realize that's what he was saying. Much more detail in the lecture. Or the second page. It's um, on the left, you have a selection from his, what's called his disputed questions. His primary duty as a master in scripture uh, was to lecture on the scriptures. Um, his, so to speak, his secondary duty was to hold very, very formal, highly formalized disputations as they were called. We might want to think of them as, as discussions. I'll get into that a little bit more later. But these were oriented to talking about the topics that somebody interpreting scripture should know. But yet 
You wouldn't bring them up in a lecture on scripture. That's much too complex. But it's background information those people should know. And in the, uh, the uh, selection from the Summa, which parallels that on the right side, talking about the same, same topic, but as you'll find when you read them, he's saying different things. He's evolved from the Summa, quite definitely. The third page, I'm focusing on the Summa itself. Um, his, the third sort of major division of his works uh, would be the theological syntheses. He wrote three of them. The last one, and certainly the most important one, is the Summa of Theology. But this was written for beginners in theology, as he put it. And I'll talk more about those beginners later. And this, this page really focuses on the very famous five proofs. And what I want to do by talking about the text there is show uh, exactly how we should approach those so-called five proofs, which is not exactly the way they are presented in introductory classes to philosophy, as far as I know. The final page is taken from one of Aquinas' commentaries, which is the fourth division of his published works, the more important published works. Uh, he wrote commentaries on Aristotle, many of Aristotle's works, um, on Boethius, on, a, on Pseudo Dionysius. I've given you one here from the Ethics, again paralleling it with a passage from the Summa of Theology. And here again is a case where he evolves. He evolves from the Summa. He's saying something different in his commentary on the ethics. So uh, just through this rapid run through here, this is why I think it's important to read Thomas Aquinas. He writes different, different things are written for different audiences. They would therefore have different levels of detail, of precision, um, and all of that really should be taken into account. Um, let's begin with the uh, first page and the lecture on John. Uh, or rather, I must begin with the first page, but let's, let's read the Summa first because it's, it's simpler. The subject asked, or the question raised there, is word a personal name when said of God? A bit of the theological background is necessary, I suppose. Um, from the 5th century, Augustine, St. Augustine's in, uh, view or interpretation or discussion of the Trinity was more or less classic and is still classic for all uh, Christian sects who would talk about the Trinity. Augustine was made the point that human beings, or the world, the world is made in the image of God, but human beings are made in the image of God. And therefore, the greatest image of God that could be found in human beings would be in the highest part of the human being, which is in the mind. And Augustine was trying to find some sort of resemblance of the Trinity as a way of being able to handle uh, discussions of the Trinity. I mean, because when you consider it, as, as Muslims say, it's just a contradictory notion. You've got one God and three persons. And, uh, they're all three God, but you've all still only got one God. What's going on? Well, Augustine was trying to find a resemblance in human intelligence for this. And what he finally came up with was that we are able to draw out of our memory some knowledge of ourselves. We draw that out of our memory. So the source of this knowledge, the memory, for him, I mean, I'm really oversimplifying, but that is going to be a resemblance of God the Father, the first person of the Christian Trinity. In insofar as we draw out, we can draw out of our memory uh, uh, some sort of knowledge of ourselves, this knowledge we draw out, this expression from the memory, that's the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. Uh, because you do find in, in scripture indications that that the son comes from the father the son is the expression of the father and so on and and as augustine would say it sounds like an expression of knowledge and then of course 
um, looking at at this knowledge we have of ourselves, uh, we would we find ourselves to be something worthwhile. This is in the back of his mind here. I think is that old notion of we always try to preserve our existence. Uh, we always want to keep going. Uh, you know that we really do like ourselves, and from that he's, he's trying to he's trying to make the point that that when we look at what we what we are in terms of our thinking ability and so on, we find something pleasing. Now to find something pleasing is really, from a philosophical point of view, you find something desirable, this is love. So there we've got the Holy Spirit, the love that comes from the Father to the Son. Of course, the Trinity is much more complicated, but anyway, this, this has become classic and word then has has be, become a, a name for the knowledge that the mind expresses. Uh, whether whether the mind is thinking of stones or whether the mind is thinking of a tree or a person, uh, it expresses this. And um, so let, let's let's look at at some of the things here in the Summa's text. He starts off, you'll notice on the contrary, this is his way of invoking an authority. In this case, it's, it's Augustine, who says in his book, De Trinitate, on the Trinity, just as the Son is referred to the Father, so word is referred to that whose word it is. But Son is a personal name, because it is said relatively, so too is word. In other words, if you refer to somebody as a son, well, in the background is a father. If you have a word, well, the word has been produced by someone. So from that point of view, Augustine means that um, it, it's relative. And so if we use word of the second person of the Trinity, call him the word of the father, we've given him a personal name. Okay. Now, in regard to this, what Aquinas does, this is his typical approach in the Summa, he's now going to reason in some way, and this is where his philosophy uh, comes in, he's going to reason in some way to say the, either to interpret what Augustine is saying or show you that this is correct. And in, in this case, it's more just explaining to you what a word is and why it would make sense to think about the Son of God as a word produced by the Father. But notice then the, the next paragraph which begins in evidence of this. Um, he's talking about how word is used. Word is said properly in three ways. And the next sentence, the most evident and most common use is when word is that which is proclaimed vocally or, or a sound. I'm speaking lots of words. That's the almost common use of word. But then, notice the next sentence, which is crucial here. Insofar as the external word proceeds from within, two things are found in it, the sound itself and the signification. If I say tree, well, there's a sound, and then there's the signification. What is my word signifying? And he, he answers that in the next sentence. A sound, or a sound signified, a, a sound signifies what is conceived by the intellect, according to the philosopher. The philosopher is always Aristotle. So when we speak words, they signify something conceived by the intellect or the mind. And he, he goes on to talk then about the sound proceeds from the imagination, as he said in the De Anima. Uh, the sound that does not signify cannot be called word. When we just babble, we don't call those words. Uh, hubba hubba and ba 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 ba. Those aren't words. They're just sounds. There's no signifying. They're not signifying anything that we're thinking. And the final sentence of that paragraph. Therefore, word is said to be an externally spoken word because it signifies 
an internal conception of the mind. Okay. The point is, what do we mean by an internal conception of the mind? But he goes on in the next paragraph simply to, to mention three ways we can use word. One is this internal conception. Another one is we can, we can, um, well, I lost my place here. Uh, okay, first and principally, the internal conception of the mind is called word. Secondarily, the sound, that sound, the external spoken word is called word. Third, the imagination of the sound is called word. We can imagine a sound. That could be called a word too. And so he comes back then to Augustine. Properly word is said to be in God insofar as a word signifies the concept of the intellect. Above, he called it internal conception of the intellect. Now he's calling it the concept of the intellect. Um, and, but notice the final sentence, jump down that far. Thus, it belongs to the reality of the concept that it proceeds from something else, namely from the knowledge of the one conceiving it. So when I speak a word like tree, it is signifying something within me, and that thing within me has proceeded from, the, from my knowledge. Okay. If this sounds rather strange, um, I, I just want to suggest uh, a resemblance to Descartes, who after he has um, doubted the existence of the world, the existence of himself, of, of his body, he knows he, he is thinking, and then after a little bit he starts examining those thoughts within him. Are those thoughts Aquinas' eternal word, the internal word? Um, let, let's look at, at what John has to say here. Um, and I, I think that I'd, I'd like to uh, jump down to the, the third paragraph beginning in our intellect. In our intellect there are three things. Number one, the potency of the intellect. In other words, the mind as capable of thinking or the mind as capable of understanding human beings or trees or elephants or something else. The mind as a capability. Second, the species of the thing understood, which is its form as related to the intellect itself, just as the species of color is related to the eye's pupil. Aquinas was a metaphysician. Uh, he, would, he never thought of the human who knows as a subject. The word subject is used in Aquinas as a logical term. It's the subject of a proposition. A predicate is, or uh, another word is, is predicated of a subject. He doesn't refer to the subject that knows um, man knows, the human being knows, but it's the, the mind is an ability to know. That's the potency. When it, in order to know, something's going to happen to it. According to Aristotelian philosophy, to pass from a potential situation to an actual situation, something has to be received in the potency. This is a metaphysical talk not psychological talk. To explain the change from potency to act, something has to, uh, something new has to be there in the potency, and that in this case is called the species or form. Then third, the third thing in, in, the, in the soul, so to speak, in the mind, is the activity of the intellect, which is intellection. And so these are three things in, in the soul. And then notice what he says. None of these is signified by the external spoken word. For example, the name stone does not signify the substance of the intellect because that isn't what we intend to say in using the name. Nor does it signify the species, which is the means by which the intellect 
has its intellection, since this also is not what is intended, nor does it signify the very activity of intellecting, since that activity is not one proceeding externally from the mind that intellects. The, in other words, the word that stone signifies is something other than these three, it is something produced by the mind. This is how they could find this as an image of the Trinity, the Son produced by the Father. Therefore, that properly is called internal word that is formed by the one intellecting as he intellects. And I'm wondering if you saw this in the Summa, in that part of the Summa, if you would see it reading the Summa. It doesn't contradict the Summa, but it's going into much more detail. And so he concludes what is expressed as, as formed in the soul is called the internal word. It is compared to the intellect, not as that by which the intellect intellects or understands, but as that which it intellects, that which it understands, since it sees in what it expresses the nature of the thing intellected. Is this, De or is this Descartes' ideas that he can look at? And when he, in giving this lecture, he's, he's, he is speaking to students whom, whom, as I said, are working toward being a master in scripture themselves, working in a university faculty of theology. The Summa of Theology was written, as he says in his prologue, for beginners in theology. When he started it, Aquinas was no longer in Paris at the Faculty of Arts. He had been sent to Rome to open a house of studies for students who were not intended to go on to the university. They, didn't, they were judged not to have that quality, that, those qualifications. As, as members of the religious order to which Aquinas belonged, the Dominican order, their proper name is the Order of Preachers, these students were to be, go out and preach after they finished their training. Those are the students for whom he wrote the Summa. Um, the next page, page two, is a disputed question. Aquinas, in published, in published form, we have more than 500 of these, and we have another 250 of a sort of related type of, of disputed question of his. I chose this one because you, it's, it's one of the very few that's short. Um, usually, because he's going into the great, great, great detail. What, what, the way these were or organized, as the professor at the university there in Paris, he would take his senior students and tell them, like in this case, I'm going to defend the fact that there's only one principle of being in Christ. And so their task was to look back at what other people had said in the past and maybe we're still saying today in Paris and come up with objections to that. In other words, there's more than one is what they were trying to defend. And sometimes in these disputed questions you have 20 and 25 objections like this. Well, the, it was highly formalized, as I say, and the students would one by one make these objections. Aquinas would then give his view and then answer the objections one by one. This was to prepare them, again, for their future life as teachers of scripture, interpreters of scripture in a university. Um, this is much too complicated to um, try and, and read together here. But uh, if you're interested, I hope you'll look at it later. But what, he's, what it amounts to, um, I think, can best be seen if we, if we approach it in a way that he really didn't. If you look at the bottom of the left-hand column, whereas Aquinas is totally being metaphysical in this, as he always was, uh, the bottom, the, the statement I've got in brackets, is an expression of a general rule concerning contingent predication of God. 
it is a rule that once you once you hear of it and start reading Aquinas, you realize he follows this rule. He never stated it, but he follows it. And suppose the, in this case, the contingent predication is God became man. All right, look at what this says. The truth of a contingent predication of God is constituted by the being of God, but there is needed as a condition something created that is external to God. If you're saying something contingent about God, you have to keep in mind that the very notion of God is this all-perfect being. Nothing can be added to him. Nothing can he, can... he does not change. He's immobile. To change would be to acquire some new perfection. If he's all-perfect, nothing to acquire, no possibility of change. So if he acts, if by, through his power, creation comes into existence, well, what is the foundation of the truth of the statement, God has created the world, or God has become man, or God worked this miracle, or whatever other contingent predication you want to throw out there? The truth has to, has to be constituted by God and by God alone. If you say what's well, also constituted by creation, then you've got you've got the, you've got this in some God in some sense depends on creation for this statement to be true. And so in the as I say, Aquinas never formulated this, but he's following it. And in the the article from the Summa, he is thinking of the fact that God became man. And so he's, he, what the question he's asking is, how many principles of reality do we have? In other words, if something is real, there's a source of internal source of his reality. Uh, and so Aquinas, the metaphysician, sees like the, the meaning in us, the meaning of human, human nature, rational animal. If that meaning really fits us, there's a source of that meaning in us. That for him is the essence. That for him is the answer to the question, what is this? You get to that. But why is this? And what is it about us or a tree or a dog or anything that is the source of its being there? And so he, he comes up with the fact that there has to be this principle, which he would simply call essay, which comes from the verb, which is the infinitive of the verb to be. And so, uh, with God, obviously the principle of being in God, in other words, the source of God's reality is God. And, and as hard as this is to, to deal with, if, God has, if there are three persons in God, the source of the reality of each one is the, source of, is the one source of reality of God. So if God becomes man, is there another, is, is it enough to say the source of reality that is God is also the source of the reality of, of God's humanity? And in the Summa, he says yes. Because what he's thinking there of is take the contingent predication, God became man. What do we need for the truth of that? We need the being of God and we need a created humanity. So we've got that. Created humanity is the condition of the truth. God's being is that. But in the disputed question, it's as if he said, hey, wait a minute. It's not Christ became, or God became man. It's God became this man. So for the truth of man, you have to have created humanity. For the truth of this man, as a condition of that predication, you have to have some secondary principle of the reality of that humanity. And so he ends up, he calls it a secondary principle of being, a secondary essay. But again, because he's dealing with, not only have, do we have an evolution here, but again, if, if you read through this, you'll find that the disputed question is much more complex, much more difficult. 
I may sound like I'm trying to run down the Summa. I'm not trying to run down the Summa. It's the obvious place to start if you want to see what Aquinas says about something. But you should never end there. Because not only does he change on occasion, but he gives you much more detail elsewhere. Almost always. The next one, page three, is from the Summa. Um, and here, my, my goal is, is to try and talk about the, the, how you have to interpret this from its context. And while this particular question in the Summa seems to be almost an extreme example of this, I think more often than not, you have to look at, at the context of the Summa from which you're taking some view. Um, the opening question of the Summa is Aquinas' fairly brief discussion of what he calls sacred doctrine, which is his, he doesn't use the term theology, regularly he talks about sacred doctrine. He makes a very important point there. Um, he, he parallels um, revelation and theology on one hand with Aristotle's metaphysics and physics, and de anima, ethics on the other hand. Metaphysics for Aristotle was the first science, not only in the sense that it studied the highest of beings, uh, but as well it studied all the common concepts, the general concepts that are used throughout any sort of organized knowledge, like principle, cause, element, being, what are some others, potency, form, all of these, the, the metaphysics, Aristotle's metaphysics runs through these. And, and it's up to metaphysics to figure these out, like the general notion of, of, uh, of essence, for example. Uh, and then, when, you, when Aristotle wants to study the physical world, he's going, to, he's going to study the way the world changes, the change that goes on in the world. He takes these metaphysical concepts and he applies them to the physical universe. When he studies the soul or human being, he takes them and applies them there. And it's as if Aristotle is saying, look, metaphysics tells me what, say, essence is or what form is or what disposition is. Now I'm looking at material things to see how I find dispositions there or forms there or beings there, what they're like in the physical order. So it's as if metaphysics tells him what to look for. And Aquinas says that's what revelation does. It tells the theologian what to look for in the world because that's what it's all about. God supposedly is talking about human history and human life and so on. So you take scripture or you can also take these respected uh, early fathers of the church from the first five centuries like Augustine or Tertullian or somebody else who have sort of synthesized some of the biblical texts and you, you take what they say and look at the world. But what you're trying to do is find a, some sort of, of reflection in the world of what the revelation or people who have studied revelation said. You're trying to see how that's in the world. And so when he starts off, first the question after this, question two of the Summa, he says, is there a God? That's the question, which seems rather strange for somebody who's writing a theology to start with the existence of God. But there's a, a couple of reasons for this. One is the existence of Anselm's ontological argument. But in back of that is the fact that scripture talks about human beings' ability to know there's a God. And so he starts his, his theology there. And his first question is, is the existence of God known of itself? Is the existence of God known of itself? Is it a self-evident proposition that God exists? 
And the, he, he quotes at the beginning a text from scriptures. And it's Anselm's text. The fool says in his heart there is no God. Anselm interpreted that to mean this person is a fool who says there's no God because he's what, he re what he's really saying is the existing God, uh, is the existing being doesn't exist, which is sort of a nonsensical statement. If you have existence in the subject of your sentence, you shouldn't take it away in the predicate of your sentence, is Aquinas' point. So it's a case in which he's, he's saying, uh, Scripture says, uh, the fool says in his heart there is no God, and Aquinas' interpretation of that is really, it's foolish to say there's no God because if you look around the world, you'll see there is. That's Aquinas' interpretation. But he's taking the scriptural text and trying to see what the world is. In the second article, he then asks, is it possible to demonstrate that God exists? And he doesn't give any, he cites there, uh, and this is the first thing I've given you in the left-hand column, he cites this verse from Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the invisible things of God are seen through the understanding of things that are made. And what he does then is not tell you any of these invisible things or anything like that. He, he simply take, takes the opportunity of saying uh, there, there can be if it, what he's really saying, in fact, is if you look at the world and you find something there that can only be explained by what you'd think of as a divine cause, then this is what Scripture is talking about. The invisible things of, of God can be seen through, through understanding what's been made. And so Aquinas says, if you find something that looks like an effect of a divine cause, you know, so to speak, that's what Scripture is speaking of, it's possible, therefore, to demonstrate that God exists. Then the third question, where he gives these five ways. But notice his scriptural text, which should govern what he's looking for. On the contrary is what is said in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, by the person of God, I am who am. This is a reference to Moses going up the side of Mount Sinai and seeing the bush burning that's not really being burnt up. This voice talks to him and so on and sends him off to Egypt, then Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And the answer is, I am who am. Which right from the beginning has been taken to mean that God's revelation of himself as complete reality, complete being, his, his very, what can we say, his very nature is, is to be. If you ask, what is it? You have to say it's to be, it's being, and so on. But now, do any of the five ways show us that? Aquinas, when he continues, I haven't tried to type out or copy out here any of the five ways. I presume people have seen them often enough. Um, after each one, he says, and this we call God, or this we understand to be God, and so on. Every one of them is taken from somebody else who preceded Aquinas. The first one, for example, is from Moses Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed. Aquinas is just sum summarizing them here. And uh, one question I have is, um, would Aquinas, and in other words, in regard to how, sh how should we take these? Are these Aquinas' proofs of, for God? Well. There weren't any atheists around. Okay. And this is for beginners. They're going out to preach. Okay. Um, second, in the Summa Against the Gentiles, Book 1, Chapter 13, he really presents the first of the two ways in considerably, considerable detail. Plus, a very brief reference to the, the fifth way. But the first two, much greater detail. He was writing the Summa at the request of some higher up in the Dominican order who envisioned the Dominicans being sent off to Spain. This is what we think happened. Dominica, he envisioned Dominicans being sent off to Spain where they'd meet Muslims. And, you know, 
what did they need to know for their preaching? This is what the Summa against the Gentiles is supposed to reflect. And Aquinas seems to have thought, well, they need to know something about how to argue for the existence of God. Um, another, another thing here, um, I've already mentioned the fact that there, they, all these arguments were, these are just summaries of arguments found earlier, earlier people. And finally, there is this problem, as I've already mentioned too, raised by that scriptural authority giving there, I am who am. I'm not sure if any of the four proofs actually end up with an I am who am. Maybe the fourth one, degrees of being, but certainly not the other, other four. You could reason from the other four, from their conclusions, to this sort of I am who am God. But the very fact that you'd have to do more reasoning means they're not proofs. They're not finished. And I think in re what, I'm, what I'm just trying to say here, I'm not trying to run down the Summa, I'm trying to say we've got to read it in its context. And now I've also given you on the same page uh, his, what he has to say in the lecture on, on this particular epistle of St. Paul. Um, and I've also given there in the left-hand column, the bottom half, uh, what he said about, some of what he said about the, the verse preceding it, which verse 19 read, what is known about God is evident to them, for God has shown it to them. The them refers to uh, people that, or men that he saw in Athens who were doing all sorts of things that in Paul's mind were, was sinful, and they shouldn't, uh, they should have known that there's a God and that these things they're doing are wrong. That's the way he, he uh, interprets that text. But he, in what I've given here from paragraph number 115 there is just part of it, he's talking here about the what is known about God part. And notice how he writes. From sensible creatures, man can know God in three ways, as Dionysius says. One way is through causality because sensible creatures are defective and can be changed, it is necessary to trace them back to some immobile and perfect principle. In this way, it is known there is a God. I mean, that's like, if you want, a summary of, of what, you could, what he could uh, develop into a proof. But, you know, this is a lecture to, this is a lecture on scripture. And you wouldn't go into a try to give any detailed proof in that context. Second, by way of excellence, all things are not traced back to a first principle as if to a cause univocal to creatures, for example, as man generates man, but traced back to a cause of all that is superior to them. In other words, we're not using univocal uh, concepts when we refer to God's wisdom or, or goodness or anything else. We have, we have to admit that, that uh, God, whatever goodness means, it doesn't mean what it means for us and when it's applied to us. Third, by way of negation, if God is so superior to his effects, nothing in creatures can be proper to God. According to this, we say that God is immobile and infinite and perhaps other similar things. Um, to jump ahead a little bit, it's interesting that his very next question in the Summa begins, we do not know what God is, we know what he's not. And now we're going to start talking about what he's not. And for the next nine questions, he talks about God is not multiple, he's simple, he's not imperfect, has, we have to say he's perfect, he's not good the way we are, he's not finite, he's infinite, uh, he's not mutable, he's immutable, and so on. Um, so those are the things that, that you, you would know, uh, you, that we should be able to know about God. And then in Romans 1.20, this is the text that he used in the Summa in Article 2, 
the invisible things of God, his eternal power and divinity, he didn't put those three words in there in the Summa, can be known through the understanding of what has been made. Here, and Aquinas is undoubtedly working from a text in the Summa. He was working from memory when he quoted the text. What he, what he proceeds to do, uh, and this might be a little bit confusing because the second paragraph starts with first, and then we, then we go one, two, three. Actually, what's happening here, I, I've left out uh, t the real two and three. The first, the first is talking about the invisible things of God, his eternal power and divinity. The text I've left out is talking about the rest of the sentence, number two and number three. Uh, which contain very little that we need to bother with here. But this is just an explanation of the invisible things that we should, we, he thinks we should know. He's explaining that text. And notice he says in the third paragraph, the first is the invisible things of God by which is to be understand the essence of God, which, as was said much earlier, cannot, we cannot see. Invisible in the plural is said, because God's essence is not known by us according to what it is, that is, insofar as in itself it is one. Any notion of God is a, is a notion of simple being, uniting in some sort of unity, all perfection. That, uh, Aquinas says, we, the text uses in, in invisibles instead of invisible because we have to come up with lots of words to talk about God's simplicity. However, what is one in God is made known to us through certain resemblances had in creatures. Creatures participate in many ways in what is one in God. And so, as he says, our intellect considers the unity of the divine essence from the perspective of goodness, power, wisdom, and so on. Um, power there is used in the sense of our individual power to do things, to perform actions, and so on. The next uh, two, two paragraphs beyond that, he returns to power, but this is God's eternal power. And there he says, another thing known of God is his power by which reality proceeds from him as from a principle. And so Paul says his eternal power. Note that um, power here, this little paragraph, we can know reality proceeds from God uh, certainly, the w ways in the Summa, ways 1, 2, 3, and 5 would be related to this. The fourth way um, is, is more, I think, the, the back up with the invisibles. But then third, there's a third thing known that he calls divinity to which is related our knowledge of God as the end to which all things tend. The only sense I can make out of that is Aquinas is thinking of the same sort of thing that, that Augustine does in his Confessions when he says the human heart will, let's see, he starts off and says, the human heart will not rest until it rests in you, O Lord. In other words, only God can satisfy the longings of, of human beings for happiness. And I think that's what he means here, that that we can know God in that sense as that toward which all things that we tend, that the, what he is what we want. And the next simply se sentence simply says that. That's why he used, he used the word divinity instead of deity. The deity would refer to God as a, as a reality. Um, and divinity is, is understood here as the goal which we seek. Then in the final paragraph, which I want to mention because it goes back to these three ways of knowing God that on the, the bottom of the left-hand page. The three things known correspond to the three modes of knowing spoken of earlier. The invisible things of God are known through the way of negation. We know God's goodness, wisdom, power, etc. by seeing him as different from our world. Eternal power is known by way of causality. Okay, and divinity by the way of excellence. That may be where we'd fit the fourth proof under, the fourth way under. And so, what I want to 
conclude from all of this is we should be very careful in considering Aquinas' five ways to be proofs of God, especially the way they're taken up usually in anthologies to be used in introductions, that it's part of his theology. It's, it's simply his way of explaining to young people who are going to go out and preach that, um, that these are ways that you can talk about with people, but it's, I don't think it should be taken for anything more than that. The final page, Aquinas is, is taken from Aquinas' commentary on the ethics. Uh, Aquinas' commentaries back in the 50s and 60s, 70s, when I started philosophy, um, there was a big dispute. Some people said, oh, you can't trust these. We could have lost them all and we'd have lost nothing. Other people said, no, every word there is Aquinas's. Other people said, no, read through it. This paragraph is explaining Aristotle. This paragraph, he's giving his own view. But since then, I think times have changed. Um, if, you, if you take each of his commentaries, first there is the fact he never taught them. He never taught them. There is, secondly, there's the fact that in, every, in, in the big ones, the commentary on the ethics, commentary on the metaphysics, commentary on the physics, and commentary on the de anima, or the soul, in every one of those, you can find passages where he is clearly uh, opposing some other well-known view of his time. Uh, there are, in the, in the case of the de anima, it's, it's, it's so obvious it's embarrassing. There were just dozens of views of the soul and the intelligence and so on, and he was just tired of that. In his mind, Aristotle, and I think you get that when you, when you ask yourself, why did he write these? Uh, he wrote them because the theologian needs philosophical concepts. That's the only way he's going to be able to understand scripture with human concepts, and the most precise ones are from philosophers. Who's the best philosopher? As far as he knew, it was Aristotle. And he knew there were problems with Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle's God doesn't know the world, okay? Aristotle's God is eternal, uh, he created, or the, the world has existed from eternity, okay? And he makes it very clear why he doesn't agree with those sorts of things when he's commenting on them. But when you, when you go through them, for example, with the metaphysics, you can see that from time to time he looked at Averroes' commentary and then the commentary from Albertus Magnus, who was his teacher. And you can see that here he's responding to one, here he's responding to another. With the um, ethics, Aquinas was the first one you can see it when you make these comparisons. He was the first one to, to state that the final book of the ethics is not talking about the happiness of political life, but it's talking about the happiness of individual creatures. Um, so anyway, uh, the, 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 his commentaries on the ethics are, are I propose, his his views of the correct philosophy to use in uh, theology. So if you want to find out what Aquinas really thinks about something, the Summa is a good place to start. But the commentaries are something you have to look at and see what he had to say. In this one here, I'm running out of time here, so I'll just be very brief here. But from the Summa, um, in the Summa, he's saying that prudence, prudence um, is in reason. Uh, Aristotle, in, in uh, the sixth book of the Ethics, said prudence is not with reason alone. 
That's in the next to last paragraph of the right hand column. Prudence is not with reason alone. I mean, excuse me, yeah, not with reason alone. Uh, and Aquinas' po uh, point in the Summa is it's not with reason alone because there's an application made to activity. An application to activity which happens insofar as the, as the will is, is choosing. In the commentary on the ethics, uh, he's saying prudence is in reason, but there is a part of the sensitive soul that is known as particular reason or the cogitative power. It's an internal sense that human beings have. Prudence is there in some internal sense by which uh, they contact the world and learn about this and that and what works and what doesn't and so on. But as Aristotle said, uh, prudence is not in reason alone and as Aquinas puts it, it is not with reason alone but in the, in the, in the ethics, but it requires the rectitude of appetite. And what he has in mind here is, is that prudence is an internal sense of what to do, when to do it, and so on, but it's not really going to be there unless your appetites are correctly directed. Your, your internal sense is particular reason will only come to the conclusion that this is what you must do or this is what you must not do if your appetites are your will, your sensible desire, your sensible appetites, if these are oriented to the proper human goal. And so what I've wanted to conclude from all of this is, is that, as I said, when, when we approach Aquinas, we need to be aware of the audience for which he wrote, the goals he had in mind for each book, and we should never, I think, never be satisfied with what he says in one place. Okay, thank you for your attention. His reference to Vienna. I see that this is, is very applicable to the potential, the actuality, and this kind of this second order actuality of, of inaction or activity. And I see also, um, in regards to this, your, your discussion of the divinity um, as related to uh, this excellence, right? Divinity by way of excellence, or almost, I read in there a lot of Aristotle's virtue and happiness, right? Like, how we achieve that happiness. So my question for you is, is when we read uh, the lectures, as opposed to reading the symbol, when we read the lectures, how much should we take a, um, a fundamental understanding of Aristotle as the basis? Right? How much should we take Aquinas' understanding? Of oh, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, you take a, if you want to know what he's saying, you take his, and you'll get his from the... Um, from the commentaries. Also, if, if you wanted to go to the trouble, all of the Latin versions that he would have known have been published in something called Aristoteles Latinus. So they're all there if you ever want to. When, when you open, when, when you look into any of his commentaries that are not uh, critical, part of the Leonine critical edition, the uh, text from Aristotle they give you is not the one he would have looked at. I mean, they, I mean, it's just not, it might be in part, but it's just not, not at all what he had. I guess my thought for that is that he was actually teaching this to people who were going to become masters of, of scripture. Um, to what extent was he relying on them understanding his reading of Aristotle versus perhaps, as you said, he was, he said some things that were contrary to what was taken to be at the time. Yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah, that would be a problem because they would have gone through the Faculty of Arts at the University of Paris, most likely. Or some of them might have come, Albert the Great, Albert, Albertus Manius had gone up to Cologne and had founded a house of studies for some of them. But it, it's doubtful that many of them would have come from there. And in the, um, 
Faculty of Arts, they would have been hearing, especially from about, well, during his last period there, they would have been get, hearing a lot from about Averroes, Averroes' uh, interpretations of Aristotle. And so he might have had some problems, but, you know, we don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not at all aware of of anybody even, that's a very good topic, not at all aware of anybody even raising that issue. Yeah. Right. Yes? If I'm understanding uh, correctly, one of the telltale signs on how many audience he's writing for is that he's easier in the writing, kind of the less educated the audience, correct? So assume it was kind of for beginners and then... Mm -hmm. The others for Masters of Divinity. Is there a type of writing style that's telltale for the expression of his own views rather than the specific work? You, you mentioned that his work on the ethics was some of his commentary, but it didn't relate to writing style, and the other two did. I was wondering if there's a telltale sign for reading stuff we've encountered before if we know. No, no. No, because see, when he, in, in the commentaries, it's, um, not sure can, whether you can see it from that brief thing here. Like the very, the final page four, the, the one from the ethics, notice in the very first uh, sentence, the expression particular things that can happen. He's very much uh, tied down by what Aristotle says and when Aristotle says it. Um, so you, you know, um, he, he's explaining Aristotle sort of line, really almost line by line. One thing that is, I guess imp important, I should have stressed this. Um, when he feels that you need a little bit more explanation of this, he, he has certain terms he uses. Uh, in, in, in English, they'd be translated as uh, something like one must consider this or it must be considered or it must be known or in Latin, it comes out sciendum est or considerandum est and so on. When you see that, that means Aquinas is pausing to sort of fill in something or maybe relate it to another work of Aristotle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, regarding your elaboration on um, sorry, uh, page three of the uh, article three in question two of mm -hmm. part one, um, it seems to me uh, you suggested that the five ways were meant to um, prove the statement, I am that I am. Okay. No, I didn't mean to say that, no. Okay. They don't go that far. Right. So, but, but in other words, his, his usual procedure is to give either like, like, um, like on, page, on page four, his authority is Augustine. And here it's the, it's the scripture. Whatever authority he gives... It, it, is, it is either going to determine what he says, he's going to draw out something from it, or he's going to explain it. But in this case, see, he's not doing that. He's really going from what he said the one before in, in the preceding article where he quoted the invisible things of God and so on. Um, and, you know, the only thing I can say there is he would, he would take it for granted that we would recognize he hasn't gotten there. And perhaps we should stress even more than I, than I did, I think I just mentioned it, but right after this one, of course, he starts into question three, which starts off with, uh, you know, we don't know what God is. In the sense that we don't understand him. We only know what he's not which comes back to this. We, we're not going to understand this I am who am, but we certainly could if, if, you, if you know, if you take it for granted that there is this cause, this creator, this, this cause, and um, that nothing causes him, you could go on and reason this has to be a being that 
just is being and so on, is the I am who am. You could go on from that, but it you know, doesn't do it. Yes? Question uh, regarding something that's somewhat controversial in Aristotle's um, So the question is in day on, uh, the active and passive intellect, uh, what is your view on Aquinas' understanding of the active intellect and its connection to God? Oh, uh, He's very, very definite on that. Um, uh, Averroes probably, uh, from modern view, had a better view of Aristotle than Aquinas did. And uh, Aquinas is just as ex uh, opposed to Averroes as, as can be, opposed to the notion that there's one agent intellect, one active intellect for all, all human beings. Uh, Aquinas is very, very definite that each individual person has an active intellect. Um, and he, he paces a um, great deal of stress on the fact that, that, that I think, you know, that I think it's me. And it can't be me if, if it's not my mind that is doing this. He, he um, and again in this he's a little bit like uh, Augustine. Most theologians are a little bit like Augustine. Um, they see God as somehow or other um, not directly, well, they, they see us as the human, human intelligence as somehow or other like a created resemblance to God. So just as scripture is full of things about God, God as being light and so on, they talk, Aquinas will talk about the light of the aging intellect, which is like God's gift to us so that we, you know, do our own thinking and so on. Yeah. Uh, so we have time for one more question, so I'll go ahead and jump on it since no hands are up. Uh, question about reading Aquinas in context. When he introduces the five ways, he talks about them as scientifically knowable demonstrations quia, or demonstrations that something is the case. Importing into that, you would think everything he says about quia demonstrations in his commentary on the posterior analytics. But in his Summa Theologiae, or Summa Contra Gentiles, he talks about the proofs he's going to give as merely probable. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the five ways as more towards the merely probable side, it sounded like, as ways to maybe talk about God for people. So it seems, it's always seemed to me, there's a little tension there for Aquinas in that we're to view as probable what he introduces as a scientific demonstration of a necessarily existent being. I was just wondering if you'd reflect on that for a minute. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um. See, I don't, I don't know that he would, he would say that, that the arguments that he's just summarizing here in the Summa, I don't know that he'd say they're just probable, but the stress is that, that he's not giving them as his, and he's not giving them as complete. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really what the answer to your question is. He... He doesn't seem to me to be one that, I mean, many times, you know, he speaks about uh, our failings, obviously we're fallible creatures and so on and so forth. Um, and I guess you could make an argument that he would, he would say that even, even when we have or develop some sort of uh, syllogism that ends up with a god, um, we should be aware that this, be be aware of the fact that we are human, fallible human beings thinking. But I don't know that I ever saw him say that. So I no, I don't I don't know what the real answer to your question is. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you.